You can join me in opening up your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. And um, I hope that you do uh, bring a Bible on Sundays. It can be helpful to use the copy that you're using throughout the week also together. Um, If you don't have one with you, you can grab one under seats in front of you. Um, Page 944 is the page that we'll be looking at for Romans 8 this morning, continuing our series. And we've been seeing that Romans 8 is about how God and His great power and mercy and wisdom meets us in the confusion of our suffering. So, we've seen from the first half of Romans 8, it's all wonder, the grace that's ours in Jesus. No condemnation, set free from the power of sin, given a new mindset, a new eternal future. We now are empowered to inevitably begin killing sin in our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. We have been adopted into a new family as sons and daughters of the one true God. We have a new inheritance, a future of glory to come. But then in verse 17, it says that none of this grace and wonder and coming glory means that we get out of suffering now. And so, from verse 18 on in this chapter, Paul gives us reasons for hope in the midst of suffering. So, we've been seeing a few of those reasons in the past few weeks. We've seen that God gives us hope by showing us that the future inheritance, the future glory to come far outweighs the suffering of the current time we live in. We have a resurrection glory coming. Another comfort is that in all of our suffering, when we're so confused and burdened, we don't even know how to pray. The Holy Spirit is with us, interceding for us, groaning too deep for words, and God hears Him and answers. And now we have another reason for hope, and it's because God right now and in every single moment is working everything together for the good of His people. So, this is Romans 8, 28. Let's read it together. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. I know some of you have that memorized. Some of you have it memorized because you intentionally tried to memorize it. Some of you have it memorized because you've clung to it in the hardest seasons of life, and it's just in you. Uh, If this is the first time you've ever heard that read, uh, I commend this verse to you to be a constant companion for the rest of your life. It's one of the greatest promises in the Bible. It addresses our confused hopelessness in the hardest suffering. Sometimes we wonder is it all pointless? Why did God let this happen? Maybe He couldn't stop it. Can He make anything of this mess? Maybe He doesn't care. Maybe this is beyond His control. Our mind is clouded with confusion in those times. Our hearts are heavy with hopelessness. And Romans 8.28 says that Christians can have absolute confidence that every single thing, every part of even the worst suffering is worked together for your good. This is God's heart for God's people. This assumes God's power. It assumes His wisdom. It assumes His love actively engaged in every moment. He not only forgives us, and transforms us, and promises an incredible future. He also works every single thing in our lives together for our good. And He gives this promise to you as a Christian, or if you are not yet a Christian, He welcomes you into this promise through faith in Jesus. He gives this to His people so that you can live through suffering with a settled confidence. God works everything together for the good of His people. So, three questions. What is this promise? What does it mean? Who can claim it? And what difference does it make? Really, the question that we're asking is this third one of what difference does it make? And it's, what if you could know in the worst suffering that everything 
is being worked together for your good by God. So what's the promise? Well, the promise itself is right in the middle of the verse. All things work together for good. There's three parts to this promise, so let's just walk through this phrase by phrase. All things. Every single thing you experience in life is within the scope of this promise. There's, there's not a sphere that's called like all things according to Romans 8.28, and then there's some other things that we know aren't actually included here. No, this is everything. This is not just saying that God works the good things together for good. It wouldn't need to be said. God works all things together for your good. This includes pain and suffering, all pain and all suffering. That's, I mean, suffering is the focus of this section in Romans 8. It's all about hardship and groaning, longing to be free from the pains and the sufferings and the sins and the death of this current world before Jesus returns. Paul just said the creation itself is broken and groaning for the new creation to come. We ourselves are groaning for new bodies. There's pain and suffering, and this promise is here to give hope in the midst of those circumstances. So, the focus and emphasis of this promise is actually on suffering and hardship. So, the assumption here is that Christians should expect bad and hard things to happen to them. We should not be surprised when hardship comes. We should not be shocked by suffering. Now, there's some Christians and authors and pastors around the world and in our country and no doubt somewhere in our area that say the opposite of that, that if you come, become, become wow, <laughs> if you become a Christian, you won't be able, wow, I, should I stop? All right. If you become, some people would say, if you become a Christian, you'll never have problems speaking again. If you become a Christian, you'll never have hardship happen to you. Um, I was talking with someone just yesterday um, about a country that they had recently visited, um, and just the pervasiveness of preaching in the churches that says, um, you know, God will take suffering away if you trust in Jesus or if you give money to this ministry. Um, and many Christians are saved out of that because they need to actually hear the gospel. Hardship comes. In fact, Jesus promised it. You get added suffering when you become a Christian. Now you actually are going to be convicted more of sin. You're going to take it seriously. You're going to look foolish to people in your culture and maybe family members. And so don't be surprised. Expect it. But this is more than just a reminder that suffering will be part of our lives. This is a promise that all that suffering that comes is being worked together for good. So everything in your experience is part of this promise. This includes natural disasters like hurricanes and tornadoes, even the ones that ripped through the Midwest recently. This includes cancer and memory loss and aneurysms. It includes inexplicable pain. And it doesn't just include suffering. This includes sin. Sin is part of the all things here. God is so powerful that even sin will turn for good for God's people. The North African Church Father Augustine put it this way, God is so good as to permit no evil to exist except that God is so powerful as to be able to draw something good from any evil. So God is so good that He doesn't permit anything evil to exist except that which he is so powerful as to draw something good from any evil. So, all things means all things. Second phrase, all things work together. So, everything that happens in your life is not just a series of random events. We can use phrases like coincidence and chance, um, but as Christians, we have to recognize that if we use those phrases, we don't really mean them. There's a sense in which, from our perspective, things are coincidence. But God is the one sovereignly ordaining. He's the one working everything together. And so, God's actively involved and engaged in every moment, working everything together for the good of His people. So, this is not just a generic, optimistic hope for history. Right? This verse is not just a sentiment that says, you know, everything's going to be okay. 
This is personal trust in a sovereign God who is working presently all things together for good. Now, some translations put this differently than the one that I'm reading here. I'm reading the English Standard Version. One translation emphasizes that God is at work in all things, as if the all things are kind of happening and God's at work somehow to some level bringing something good in it. I don't think that's the best translation for a number of reasons. In this verse and examples all through the Bible show that God is working all things together. Similar to Ephesians 1.11, which says, God works all things according to the counsel of His will. Everything is being worked according to the counsel of God's will. So, He is working this out. The theological term for this is providence. Some people prefer to refer to the sovereignty of God. I've mentioned before that the elders are reading through the London Baptist Confession. I've mentioned that for maybe like the past year because we're going very slowly through it, just reading a paragraph or two at the front end of each elders meeting and then praying for you in light of the truth we read. Uh, So, it's from the 1600s. It's essentially the Westminster Confession, but adapted for uh, Baptistic churches like ours. And it gives a great definition of providence. Here's what it says. God the good creator of all things, in his infinite power and wisdom, does uphold, direct, dispose, and govern all creatures and things, from the greatest even to the least, by his wise and most holy providence. So, God, in his power and wisdom, is upholding directing, and governing everything that happens. I love how the Heidelberg Catechism puts it. Um, So, catechism, teaching tool with questions and answers. Our middle schoolers are going through the New City Catechism. So, this is a historic one, the Heidelberg Catechism. This will be up on the screen. So, here's the question. What do you understand by the providence of God? And here's the answer. Providence is the almighty and ever-present power of God by which he upholds, as with his hand, heaven and earth and all creatures, and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things, in fact, come to us, not by chance, but from His fatherly hand. So, here's the point. It means that there is a divine purpose in everything that happens. Our culture has largely rejected and neglected the notion of a personal God, but many people still tend to think and talk like there is purpose in everything. Many people use this phrase as like, well, everything happens for a reason. They see things as more than just coincidences. Some see everything as interconnected and progressing to some positive future, but they don't know why or how things work together. The Bible affirms this instinct to think there's meaning and to want there to be meaning. And the Bible says that this is true because of God's providence. So, the third and last part of the promise is all things work together for good. Now, here's what this doesn't mean. This doesn't mean all things are good. All things are not good. Some things are bad. Some things are evil. This does not say all things are good. This says all things work together for good. It means that all things, even bad things, will ultimately result in a good purpose. So, this also doesn't mean that, okay, you could say, okay, I get it. Not all things are good. There's bad things, but they work for good. Okay, so then just around the corner, if something bad happens, I'll see something good happen, right? That's not what this means. This doesn't mean that you can experience bad and suffering or evil and think a good thing is just about to come. So, you don't lose your job and then think, well, because of Romans 8, 28, I know that a better job must be coming around the corner. That's not how this works, and that's not what this says. The good purpose may be a long time coming, 
And it may not be a better circumstance in this life at all. It means that all things, even bad things, even a succession of bad things that don't seem to be turning to good circumstances anytime soon, all of it contributes for our, all this for our whole lives is contributing to being worked together for good. I think uh, my favorite line um, from anything I've ever read from John Piper um, is one line. I mean, everything I've read, I think this is just my favorite line for a lot of reasons. I've shared it before. I'll share it again. He said, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life, and you may be aware of three of them. So when you're in the hospital waiting room, nervous for the news, or right after you hear the crushing news, or if you're the one in the room on the bed, hearing the news and feeling the effects of pain. Or when a secret sin in your life is exposed and there's just wreckage coming from this. Everything you've loved is falling apart and it's your own fault. You have trouble seeing how anything good can come from this hard moment. But even here, God is doing 10,000 things And you may not know any of them. You may know three. It may get worse before it gets better for you. But if you are in Christ, everything is working together for your good. It may not feel good. You may not know what that good is right away. But it's worked, working together. So what is the good? Well, picture yourself in the midst of maybe a past suffering you've had or maybe your present suffering or anticipating a future one. Look at the furthest horizon. Just lift your eyes up out of that suffering and look at the distant horizon. The ultimate good that's coming is what Paul in this chapter refers to as glory. It's the promise of being with God in a new creation forever, in a renewed body, a body that's like Jesus' resurrection body, but even better than that, character that is transformed into Jesus' character. Perfect love and patience and goodness and kindness and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Reflecting Jesus' image, renewed in the image that we're created in. It's what Paul refers to as the glory to come. The glory is seeing God's glory in Christ and being transformed into that image. That's the glory to come. And this is where Paul goes in the next verse. Look at verse 29. It says that God predestined his people to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the ultimate good that he has in mind. All your suffering is being worked toward this goal of being conformed to the image of Jesus. But even now, you can look to a nearer horizon because God is working your suffering for your good even now. It's not just that all your suffering will then result in that. It's that all your suffering now is being worked together toward this great good. And even now, God is transforming his people to become like Jesus. He's using your suffering to draw you closer to him. He uses suffering to loosen our grip on the things we love more than him, that we might cling to him as our greatest good. Sometimes suffering comes so that he helps our soul be disillusioned by trusting anything else so that we would cling to him and depend on him. Christian knows that all, Christians know that all their trials are being worked together to make us like Christ. So that's the promise. And I want to show how this is worked out in a couple examples in the Bible. So the first is Joseph. Really brief, if you want to read his story, Genesis 37 through 50. But so the end of Genesis, he was one of the 12 sons of Jacob, but his brothers didn't like him. They were jealous of him, felt like he was being treated as the favorite, and he had a dream uh, that God gave him to prophetically see that he would be exalted over his brothers, and he, it seems, maybe foolishly shared that with them, and they didn't like that too much, so they hated him even more, so they wanted to kill him. Eventually, they got... um, a less terrible idea, but still an awful one, to sell him into slavery. So he sold into slavery to Egypt. He was initially successful there, but he's falsely accused and thrown into prison. 
He's eventually taken out of prison by Pharaoh, and he became a leader in Egypt. And there's a widespread famine. So his life is just up and down, up and down. All sorts of tragedy for many years, and then rescue and tragedy, rescue. Then there's a widespread famine, and his brothers come from their, their home to Egypt to get food. And they don't realize Joseph's in charge of this kind of food distribution, and they don't recognize him. He recognizes them, and he eventually reveals himself to them. So they're distressed. They're wondering, is, is he going to kill us? Take revenge on us? But listen to what Joseph said. Joseph had the theology of Romans 8.28 before Romans 8.28 was written. He said to them in Genesis 45, Do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. It was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house. You see how Joseph is interpreting his life, the good and the bad? God did it, and God was doing it with good purposes. Joseph was able to see some of those. We don't always get that opportunity. And his perspective is affirmed. The Psalms refer to this event and give Joseph the same interpretation. God sent him. Joseph summarized the whole situation again in Genesis 50-20. This is kind of like the personal and Old Testament Romans 8.28. He said to his brothers, as for you, referring to all their sin that they did, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. So do you hear that? Notice he didn't just say, you meant evil against me, but there were also good things that God was doing in the midst of that. No, he also didn't say, you meant evil against me, but God saw that that happened and was able to kind of use it for good. Now, Joseph uses the same word. You meant those things for evil against me. God meant those things for good. Other examples, Jesus and the cross. The cross of Christ was the most evil event in human history, wasn't it? Jewish leaders and crowds, Roman leaders and soldiers, all plotting against the Son of God. They knew He's innocent. They knew it was a great injustice. They killed Him anyway, the author and giver of life. They kill with jealousy and anger. And then listen to how the early Christians, who had the theology of Romans 8.28, listen to how they prayed in Acts chapter 4. This is verses 27 to 28. Truly in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and all the peoples of Israel. So they're all together, and in this prayer they say, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. They sinned against Jesus. And the Christians say, rightly, they did whatever God had planned and predestined to take place. They have no problem saying that God predestined sin to happen. They meant it for evil. God meant it for good. God always does good, and in everything He does, He has good motives. That is not called into question at all. But God mysteriously to us, I don't know how to explain this, mysteriously to us, is working everything together for good. There's other examples. Paul even talks about how he's got this messenger of Satan, this thorn in his flesh. He's pleading with God to take it away. And so, I mean, Satan's even involved here, right? And then he attributes it to God, say, this was meant to humble me. I don't think Satan's purpose is to humble Paul. He doesn't, Satan's not in the business of cultivating the fruit of the Spirit for people. But Paul recognizes, okay, God, you're not answering this prayer to remove this suffering because you are intending this in my life. There's other times. He's like, we were distressed, thought we were going to die, but this was meant so that we'd rely on God. So Paul just receives this as for his good ultimately. So that's the promise of Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good. So we've been answering that first question. Second question, who can claim this? Who is this for? 
There's two statements that clarify who this promise is is for. One's right before this promise, one's right after, all in this verse. So that promise is in the middle of the two statements that describe who the promise is for. And there are two statements that describe the same group of people in two different ways. The first is those who love God. See that right at the first part of the verse? And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. So this is not a promise for every person. It is for those who love God. God is sovereignly working everything together, but He's working it together for good only for those who love God. This is a way of referring to Christians. So this is not, uh, don't think that this is kind of a subclass of really good Christians who love God. You can have some Christians who don't love God and some who do. That's completely foreign uh, to the New Testament. Paul's assumptions is that all Christians love God, certainly in varying degrees. Some of you love God a lot. Some of you don't love God much. But if you are in Christ, you love Him. And you go through seasons. A Christian is someone who has repented of their sin and trusted in Jesus, and from that has a love for God cultivated. If you have saving faith, you have love for God. Second phrase that clarifies who this promise is for is the end of verse 28. All things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Again, another way of referring to all Christians. This emphasizes, though, not our subjective love for God, but God's sovereign work in bringing us to Himself. We only love Him because He first loved us and chose us. He calls us according to His purpose. So that word called is important. It's what we would theologically refer to as the effectual call. So here's what that means. The word call is used in a couple different ways throughout the New Testament. The first way is what we can refer to as the general gospel call, right? It's the, the message of the gospel spreads, and there is a call to repent and believe that, that goes to whoever hears this. It's an invitation that can be accepted or rejected. But then the second way that this word call is used is what we can refer to as the effectual call. The effectual call is the moment when God actually causes that general call to work in someone's life. It's when God uses that gospel proclamation to actually give new life. We read that earlier in Ephesians chapter 2, this idea of God making us alive. He makes us alive, causing us to respond to the call of the gospel. The best picture of this is actually when Jesus caused uh, or called Lazarus to life. So, Lazarus, dead in the tomb for days, Jesus stands at the tomb and says, Lazarus, come out. So, he's giving a call that many can hear, but through that very call, it was effective for Lazarus, and he woke up and he came to life through the call. So there's a time in a Christian's life where maybe you heard the general call enough in your life. And then there was a time where God made that effective. He effectively called you when he said, trust in Jesus, come to me. And all of a sudden you said, okay, (laughs) and you did. Or you found yourself after a season. You don't know when that moment happened, but you know it did because all of a sudden you're drawn to him now. So that's the effective, effectual call. That's how Paul uses the word Uh, Call in the next verses too. He starts talking about God's plan from his foreknowledge and predestination in eternity past to the eternal future of glorification. He says some people are chosen and called and justified and glorified. It's an unbreakable chain. All those whom he calls with this effectual call come to faith and are justified. So it seems like Paul's flow of thought in this section is we know that God works everything together for our good. How do we know this? Because we're the ones whom he's effectually called according to his purpose. He chose us and called us to himself, and he'll never let us go. If he's called us to himself, he's going to fulfill his purpose. Everything in our life is going to be worked together for good. He's not going to let us go. So that's how he's using this here in verse 20 as well. All things work together for good, not just for anyone who hears the gospel. That's not true. And what about those who don't hear the gospel then? No, this is for those who are called according to his purpose. So, who's it for? It's for Christians. Viewed from one angle, those who love Jesus. Viewed from another angle, 
those who are called according to His purpose. Now, there's an implied shadow to this promise. It means that for those who are not in Christ, this promise is not for them. Everything will not work together for their good. For those who don't trust Christ, everything in this life is ultimately worked together, not for good, but will lead to a terrible end. Even good things in this life. Paul says at the beginning of the book of Romans that for those who refuse to give thanks to God, it's storing up wrath for them. Even God's good blessings in life right now. If you reject the giver, you can enjoy them for a time here, but it's storing up wrath. You're, you're culpable for rejecting the good hand that gives you the good gifts. A judgment's coming. So this is an invitation to come to Jesus. Get out of the shadow and come to Christ. Receive his salvation through the Father's salvation through Jesus. Final question. What difference does this make? So what would be different in life if we could know that this is true? Before I answer that question, I want to encourage those of you who may struggle with what we've been considering here. Um, maybe this is all new to you. Maybe it's not, but you have struggled and still struggle with this, and you have a lot of questions, or you're not sure what to think about it. I just encourage you to keep studying this. Keep reading and thinking about this verse in its context. Read through the Bible and see how it repeatedly refers to God's providence and His sovereignty in all things. Maybe you have philosophical questions like, how does God's providence fit with free will or choices we make? It's a good question. I'd encourage you to consider that those don't have to be in conflict. I'm convinced that the Bible affirms that our choices are real and we're responsible for them, and yet God is also sovereign over all things, even our choices. He works everything, including the choices of people, for good. Read the story of Joseph. Consider the cross. Read one of the books we have at the Resource Center on Suffering or God's Sovereignty. Read through the Bible and just note when you see this perspective come up. Even Jesus, he just makes offhanded comments, like, you know, a bird falling from a branch. That's sad, but he says that doesn't even happen apart from the Father's will. You don't lose a hair of your head apart from the Father's will. He decides if that's going to happen or not. Proverbs talks about the heart of the king is in, in the Lord's hands. That even gives a helpful perspective. So there's evil churning in someone's heart, but the Lord is able to direct and, and let that river flow in different ways for different purposes. And God's never doing evil and never has evil intention, but he's working together things for his glory and our good. So how does it make a difference though? First, it gives us clarity about what God is up to. Romans 8.28 shows us the story of history and the story of our lives is like a tapestry. I remember the first time I saw one of those um, I was at my friend's house when I was a child, and on the back side, it was just this mess. White, red, blue, woven, just a mess, a mixture. And then I turned it over, and I'm like, that's a cool-looking race car. <laughs> I see what's going on here. So our lives right now, you can only see the back. You see the threads. You see it looks like a mess. But Romans 8.28 is telling us there's another side that God sees, and He's working. We may not see it yet, but it's there. He's working all the threads of our life together for our good. Second, this means that you can't mess up God's plan to do you good if you're in Christ. So many of us in this room in our culture struggle with anxiety. And one of the things that makes people anxious is this fear of making the wrong decision. We can fear that we'll make a bad decision to ruin our lives or kind of theologically feel like, Maybe I, I messed up and I've missed God's plan for my life. Like there was a plan that went this way. I made a stupid decision. I can never get back. Or maybe I got to like try to work it back. Or maybe God can work it in some way to help recover this mess that I've made because I missed his will for my life or something like this. But if we trust this promise, we can learn to live with calm. We can know that our choices matter. And God also overrules everything for our good. We can't mess up his plans. He's not surprised by your decisions. He'll take your bad decisions and even work those together for your good. This doesn't excuse your bad decisions. It doesn't excuse my bad decisions. They were bad. 
They were foolish, might have been sinful in a number of ways. This does not mean that sin is okay. It doesn't mean that God winks at sin. God hates sin. It's a serious matter. But this is saying that even our sin cannot stop God's plans. So maybe you're single and wish you were married. Maybe you're married and wish you weren't. Maybe you're married and wish that you were married to someone else. Either way, you are under God's sovereign care. He has purposes for you. And unless you have biblically affirmed reasons for divorce, you should stay faithful and trust God's sovereign care for you, even in a life that is not as enjoyable as you were hoping it would be. If you're in school, you have a lot of decisions ahead of you. What will you do next? Don't add pressure by thinking that you can miss God's will for your life and somehow just go rogue and be off the map. God doesn't intend for us to learn the future and then do it every moment. He'll make sure his plan happens without your help. You are called and I am called to make wise and good and morally upright decisions for Christ's glory and the good of others. And you can trust that God will work out the details for your good even when you screw that up. And those in midlife, you may wonder if your life matters. You may wonder if you've made the right decisions. Some rethinking is healthy. But you can also trust that whatever's happened to lead you to where you are now, God has been sovereign. Now, this doesn't mean we don't have regrets. I'm kind of confused. I think there's like a trend these days where people look in the past of their life and because all these things that have happened have brought them to where they are now, they say, I don't have regrets or I wouldn't change a thing. I think we need a little more nuance to that. Um, Because yes, God was sovereign and we're grateful for him working everything together for good and we wouldn't be where we are without him. And there's been so much blessing. But we can also regret bad decisions and repent of things we've done wrong and say to people, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. I wish I didn't do that. If I could go back, I'd do it differently. We can say those things and also know, and I'm so grateful that God's worked it together for good. His plan is perfect and I can trust in his ways. Third, this gives you a balanced view of suffering. So I've heard some people say, this is such a bad situation. Nothing good can come from this. But that situation is never true. There is no situation that has or could ever happen that is beyond God's ability to turn it for good. Someone said to me one time, that phrase about a situation Nothing good can come from this. And I gently disagreed and reminded him that some good can come from it. I actually don't remember that conversation and saying that, but I'm reminded of it because he came to me a year or so later and said, you were right. I couldn't imagine anything good coming from this situation, but I've seen it. And God's done it. On the other hand, some people can experience suffering and have the other reaction and say, this is good, right? We should embrace this as good because God's sovereign. No, it very well may be bad and hard, viewed narrowly in and of itself. We zoom out and see the big picture, and God sees the big picture and sees it work together for good. And But that action in and of itself may be sinful and wrong and bad. Again, it it would be a bad thing works together for good. This does not say that all things are good. Fourth, this gives us calm in storms. This promise is the kind of promise that can get you to sleep, even in the midst of the hardest season of life. We can sleep because God doesn't. We can stop worrying about our future so much. Because God will take care of us. Here's how Elizabeth Elliot put it. God is God. If he is God, he is worthy of my worship and my service. I will find rest nowhere but in his will. And that will is infinitely, immeasurably, unspeakably beyond my largest notions of what he is up to. So I rest in God's will. What is his will? Not quite sure. (laughs) But I rest in it because he's proven his character. He rose Jesus from the dead for me. I can trust him. 
This theology is what's needed before the storm comes. So many Christians are shocked when hardship comes into their lives, and they start rethinking their theology or getting mad at God, surprised. Suffering is hard enough to get through on its own. If we're shocked when it's come because we weren't expecting hardship to happen, and we didn't think that God could be involved and working together for good, then that doubles the pain. God doesn't promise that we won't suffer. We should expect it. And getting this theology settled before it comes is what we need. And even other people, it's often not much help, much help to them if they haven't settled this before suffering comes to so just quote this verse at them. There may be times where God could surprise us and he can use that to be comforted, but if they don't have a category for that verse to slide into, they're not ready for it to blow up their way of thinking. So often you just got to sit and cry with someone and be quiet and love them and bless them and serve them. And then over time, as they wrestle and they invite you into their questions, you can gently share how this verse has comforted you. The best thing to do would be to prepare one another for this as well. Talk about this together. Prepare your children and grandchildren with this verse. Equip them. Let them raise the questions that, that are raised when we think about this. There's a lot of hard questions that take time to work through. But do that so that when the storms come, we can be calmed in the midst. And then finally, let's remember Jesus. He endured the worst suffering for us so that this promise could be true for us. God, we do not have a God who is aloof from suffering and merely sovereignly over, sovereign over it. We have a God who in Christ has come and experienced suffering. Jesus knows what it's like to be unjustly accused and beaten and condemned and die. And he did this so that on the cross, he could take our eternal suffering for us so that the suffering of our current life right now is the worst it will ever be for us. Glory's coming. And so, I mean, I remember someone talking about this, um, Don Carson, New Testament scholar, theologian, just saying at some point, you'll go crazy if you try to understand God's sovereignty and suffering and you don't think of the cross. This isn't just abstract philosophy. You'll go crazy trying to answer these questions. Romans 8, 28, and God's sovereignty, this is, this is hard if you don't know that God is good. And it's comforting knowing that he is and that he knows what it's like in Christ. He took our eternal suffering so that he could work all our temporary suffering for good. And Jesus himself is the ultimate good. Knowing him, enjoying him, right now being conformed to his image in suffering, that is good. That is glory. It begins now in the midst of suffering and will be completed in the final horizon. So whether life is easy or hard, Jesus can be yours. If you're in Christ, he is. And he's making you like himself for your good and for his glory. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this very short collection of words that is so mysterious and profound and deep and comforting. We all together in this room right now pray for those few people in this room who are suffering and grieving the most right now. Comfort them, Lord, with this reality that you are working everything together for their good in Christ. We pray for anyone in this room who doesn't know you through Jesus. Would you call them to yourself? and comfort them with this promise through Jesus. And we pray for all of us in these coming days when your hand will allow all sorts of hardship into our lives. We pray that you would let us not lose hope and not lose heart, but remember Romans 8.28 and your good promise to us and remember Jesus. And we pray that you would make us a church and community that so trusts you and embraces this, 
that we would live with a kind of gentle calm and that other people would ask how we are responding to our sufferings in a way that they couldn't imagine as possible. And would you open up doorways for us to share the good news of the cross and resurrection of Jesus and the good news of your sovereign providence over everything and bring people to yourself. Grow your kingdom through this. In Jesus' name, amen.